Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, Supporting Mental and Emotional Health and Aging, presented by Home Instead and hosted by the American Society on Aging. We will begin shortly, but before we do, a few housekeeping notes. I would like to direct you to the left side of your screen where you will see five tabs labeled Speaker Bio, Important Information on Group Viewing, CE Application Here, FAQs and Troubleshoot, and Event Resources. The slides for today's presentation are available for download under the tab labeled Event Resources. You will find information on how to obtain CE credits for this event under the CE Application Here tab, including links to the application and to the step-by-step -step CE Guidance webpage. We have changed our CE application process. Now you'll be able to instantly download your certificate, access all your certificates in one place at any time, and receive immediate pass-fail results and complete additional attempts at any time within the 60-day period from the live webinar date. Please be aware that your time is logged and you must view the entire hour-long webinar to be eligible for CE credit and access the application. You will be able to access the CE application a minimum of two hours after viewing the event once attendance is received and recorded, although it may take up to 24 hours. So we appreciate your patience. If you are not logged into the webinar directly using the email address you registered with, then you will not be eligible for CE credit as we have no way of tracking your online attendance. If you registered before the live webinar, you will also receive a follow-up email by the end of the business day that will direct you on how to claim CEs and include links to today's slides and recording. You have 60 days from the live event date to complete a continuing education application. If you have any questions regarding today's uh, webinar, you can send those to us at any time using the Ask a Question box and we will do our best to get to those questions in the last few minutes of today's programming. And now I would like to welcome our presenters, Lakeland Eichenberger. Lakeland is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate at home instead. She educates professionals in aging, families, and communities on the unique challenges that older adults face and the resources available to help them thrive. Lakeland has worked in the private and public sectors of senior care services and has spoken at national and international conferences on caregiving and aging and served as a resource to the media. She is a board member of the National Alliance for Caregiving, board chair for the Dreamweaver Foundation, and vice chair of the Alzheimer's Association's Dementia Care Provider Roundtable. And April Ibarra who is a dynamic leader with more than 25 years of experience in healthcare and aging. She is the Strategic Accounts Manager at Home Instead Senior Care and supports the organization's mission through collaborating and creating partnerships that develop impactful relationships for the Home Instead Network. Ibarra is, a certified, is certified in Aging in Place Specialist, a Geriatric Care Manager, and a passionate champion for older adults and those who care for them. We are so excited to have you both here with us today. Thank you so much, Victoria. Hello, everyone. I'm Lakeland, and I'm excited to be joined by my colleague, April, today. And we're so happy that you have all joined us on this webinar. Today, we're talking about a really important issue, mental health and aging. We know that untreated mental health conditions can have negative impacts such as social isolation, placement in long-term care facilities, and even suicide for older adults. And those aging individuals who show signs of a mental condition are less likely than younger adults to receive mental health services. And when they do, they're less likely to receive it from a mental health specialist. So we as professionals in aging have a vital role in helping our clients and their families recognize mental health conditions and the symptoms and support them in obtaining an evaluation and appropriate treatments. Uh, again, I'm so excited to be joined today by my colleague, April. April, before we jump into it, anything that you want to add as a welcome to our listeners? 
No, I'm just so happy to be here, and I feel like everything I see now in the media and on television uh, is talking about mental health. And a recent study I just saw said that 90% of people in the United States think that the country is experiencing a mental health crisis, and I'm pretty sure no one would argue with that. So we've got a lot to talk about. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Well, that is a staggering kind of yeah, uh, if you will, to start off this conversation, but an important one. And if, if the majority of people think this is a important topic, then uh, even better that we're all discussing it today. So let's just take a quick peek at our objectives for today's presentation. So uh, April and I are going to go through the following. We're going to talk about the prevalence of mental and emotional health issues among older adults. We'll talk about the types of mental health conditions that are most common in later years. We'll talk about the current state of the industry and what resources are available for older adults. We'll also talk about the warning signs of mental distress and suicide. And then finally, we'll leave you with some resources and tools to help support the older individuals that you work with and their caregivers or care partners. So let's talk about why mental health is an important public health issue. Um, and it, it's important because it's really part of our overall health. If you look at the World Health Organization, the WHO, their definition on this slide here, uh, it states that health is a complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So these aspects of our health, mental, physical, and social well-being, they do not exist in silos. They're really interconnected. And we need to think of mental health as an essential part of our overall health and well-being, and it must be recognized and treated with the same urgency as our physical health. And as April stated, I think we're all kind of becoming more aware of our physical health, uh, or pardon me, our emotional health, uh, and the importance of making sure that we uh, are, are taking it seriously. So when we think of mental health as a public health issue, we need to recognize the impact on how our mental health kind of allows us to relate to others, how it impacts our decision making, and how we handle stress. It also impacts people's ability to live fulfilling lives. Um, and again, that's, that really is impacted by mental health. We also want to make sure we're protecting and restoring mental health as an important uh, focus of public health. So uh, if you look at the goals of public health, it includes the following things that you see on the slide, identifying risk factors. So as professionals, we need to know about the risk factors, the symptoms, and if we see them, we identify them and those that we're working with, we need to be able to direct them to resources and support. Also, an increased awareness uh, is important. When it comes to men mental health conditions and the effective uh, treatments that exist, there's this kind of myth out there that depression and anxiety are a normal part of aging. And I'm probably going to say this five times, so I apologize for sounding like a broken record. But these are not normal parts of aging. And so we, we need to debunk that myth that exists out there uh, when it comes to older adults and their mental health. We also need to work to eliminate health disparities. We know that disparities exist in healthcare in general, especially among my minority populations, rural populations. So it's important to look at the equity of services being provided. Also, we need to improve access to mental health services so that people can get help and treatment. I know that uh, it can be challenging, especially in rural uh, areas, to have access. I think one of the positives of the pandemic is that it did make us all more comfortable with telehealth, which is allowing more access, especially to mental health services. And then finally, we need to remove the stigma. Uh, more people, again, are talking about mental health. Uh, however, older generations, uh, those older adults who might be working with, they may still be resistant to openly discussing mental health. And before we get much further in this presentation, I do want to talk about the terminology around mental health. Um, I am a big believer in words matter, uh, and I know that the National Alliance on Mental Health, NAMI, 
they have some great tips on their website about mental health. I've captured a few of those here. Uh, so this chart might be helpful in the ways we talk about mental health. And it's really that person first language, which we see movement towards in other kind of areas like dementia. So uh, instead of saying a brain disorder or brain disease, uh, we want to try to use mental health condition as the term. And then when we're kind of you know, using slang terms in our everyday, um, we want to try to avoid things like saying, oh, the weather is so bipolar. Instead, saying, you know, the weather is unpredictable. Also, uh, again, that person's first language, instead of saying my mom is schizophrenic, um, instead of saying my mom has schizophrenia. It's, again, that person first, the, the, the disease, the condition that they have does not define them. So we always want to use that person first language. And again, uh, same with, you know, we, we can say, you know, client or patient, but also we should, we should say a person living with a mental health condition. Uh, and then also avoid the terms, you know, suffers from, afflicted, or mentally ill. And again, using those terms of person living with or a person has or a person experiences maybe depressive symptoms, that sort of thing. So again, I think it's important as you're talking uh, with others in your field, with the older adults that you work with, that we're all kind of using these person first terms when we talk about mental health. And I know I'm not perfect. I'll probably slip up a few times uh, in this presentation. But uh, again, I think we can all uh, do a little better uh, when we know better. So uh, next, let's talk about mental health across the lifespan. I want to reiterate the fact that mental health issues are not a normal part of aging. And if you look at the older adult population, approximately 26% of adults 60 and older meet the criteria for a diagnosed mental health condition. And when considering mental health across the lifespan, so if you look at a person's entire life, there's generally three patterns that we see. So people who have a mental health condition early in life and maintain that through their later life. So that's one pattern. Another pattern is those who grow older and experience a mental health condition for the first time later in life. And then there are those in that third pattern who come to light later life with a liability. Maybe it's a genetic influence, maybe it's a life stressor, some trauma, and then that's exacerbated by the conditions of later life, which produce a mental health condition. So again, those are kind of the three general patterns. Um, and just some, uh, a little bit more about mental health across the lifespan. Uh, we see the age of onset vary by condition, but those that are, were in that first category who had a lifetime case of mental health conditions, usually we see those diagnosed by age 42. Um, so again, earlier in their life, they're likely to be diagnosed with that condition that carries through to later life. Uh, but that second pattern is that people, you know, get to later life and then develop a mental health condition. But uh, the rate of, of um, Prevalence of the condition uh, varies even by settings. So we see a higher number of nursing home residents um, with mental health conditions. Um, if you look at the history of mental health, there was a movement towards deinstitutionalization, um, you know, decades ago, where instead of you know, having people be cared for in kind of mental health facilities, uh, there was a movement to provide more care with individuals living in the community. So uh, while that may have, I, I don't know, I don't want to say whether it was successful or not, I think the jury is still out. But as a result, we do see older adults um, with mental health conditions still sometimes end up in, an, in a nursing home or a senior living community with a mental health condition in later life. And, and that can create some, some challenges in and of itself that's probably uh, deserving of its own webinar. But uh, we do see, you know, as an older adult uh, goes through life, they build up resilience. And that might help to bolster their mental health. Uh, in their later years. So their experience, uh, they can draw on um, that, that kind of strength. I know during uh, the COVID pandemic, many older adults uh, were able to kind of draw on um, past experiences. I know my own grandparents talked a lot about polio and how they lived through the polio uh, epidemic and, and how 
Uh, they can maybe see some similarities, some differences, but again, that resilience uh, sometimes help can help an older adult um, kind of carry through in, in really tough times. But we also know that when we look at aging, um, often older adults have caregivers or care partners that are supporting them in those older years. And I think we can't lose sight of the mental health of the caregivers or care partners themselves because we know caregiving is a risk factor for mental health conditions. We see higher rates of mental health symptoms in caregivers or care partners. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that at the very end of this webinar, uh, but it's just something to keep in mind because I know so many of us work with older adults and those caregivers or care partners. Uh, a little bit earlier, I mentioned how um, you know, our mental health is not in a, in a silo. It really is interconnected with our other aspects of health and well-being. And there's this biopsychosocial model of mental health conditions that um, shows a combination of these three factors. So uh, we know that there are biological factors, and these are things like genetics, uh, medical conditions, medications, other uh, psychoactive substances, nutrition, hormones, physical trauma. Those are all biological factors. And then we know that there's psychological factors, and these are things like learned behaviors, faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking, um, how a person copes and the strategies that they use, their defense, pardon me, their defense mechanisms, their self-esteem, their, their personality traits. And then we know that there's also social factors, and these are things like culture, race, socioeconomic status, relation and influences in a person's environment. And so these three factors, these elements are really interrelated and can be interconnected. And so we need to recognize that in the older, older individuals that we're working with uh, when, we're, uh, when they're being assessed and treated for mental health conditions. Um, and so again, <clears throat> sometimes we, we want to have just this very black and white view of mental health and what is impacting it to kind of get to the root source so that we can treat it and, you know, move on. But a lot of times it's more complicated than that because there's these various factors um, that, are, that are impacting a person's mental health. So when we, we think about mental health conditions that are common among older adults, there are two that rise to the top. Uh, again, people have that misconception, misconception that depression and anxiety are normal parts of aging. It just is something that happens to you when you get older, but that is false. It's not a normal part of aging, and we do, we do not want to ignore uh, the symptoms, which I'll be sharing in just a little bit. When we look at the numbers uh, of depression, it's estimated that for major depression in older adults, uh, anywhere from 1% to 5% of older adults living kind of in the general community have um, major depression. But we see higher rates for older adults that need higher levels of care. So we see about 11.5% of older adults who are hospitalized, they have depression, and then 13.5% of older adults who require home health have depression. So again, <clears throat> um, it could be that that kind of interrelated uh, biopsychosocial model, uh, as a person needs more care and support, um, they are more likely perhaps to experience depression. And then when it comes to anxiety, it affects about 4% of older adults worldwide. But um, I, I know a lot of the research notates that for both depression and anxiety, there's often uh, an underdiagnosis of these conditions, and therefore, there's likely maybe higher percentages of these conditions that exist uh, in the older adult population, but again, just go unreported for a lot of the reasons that, that we've talked about, the stigma or the fact that people might think that it's, it's a normal part of aging. So when we look a little bit deeper at depression, again, it's not a normal part of aging. I think I've said that now five times, so I promise I'll stop, um, but again, we do know that there are things that happen to older adults uh, that can cause uh, grief and to go through that grief process, you know, losing loved ones, experiencing the loss of independence. And, you know, it is normal to experience those ups and downs in that grief in later life. But some 
experience those, um, those symptoms maybe in a prolonged fashion or they may progress to depressive symptoms that need addressing. Again, some families just assume that maybe this is normal, uh, they've lost several loved ones, friends, um, you know, they're just really sad, um, but it's important not to ignore these symptoms because a lot of times, you know, depression is treatable. There's treatments, uh, there's medications, there's psychotherapy uh, that can really go a long way in treating and restoring some quality of life for older adults. So it's really important to bring it up to a healthcare provider um, and also Sometimes the symptoms of depression can be confused with other medical conditions or problems and even can uh, sometimes be uh, mimicking of symptoms of cognitive impairment. So again, it's really important to make sure that the individual is being seen by a medical professional uh, for further evaluation. So there are four common uh, types of depression that we see among older adults. Major depressive disorder, this is, you know, where the symptoms last uh, at least two weeks and interfere with their ability to kind of do daily tasks. There's persistent depressive disorder. Um, it's a depressed mood that lasts for a long period of time, more than two years. They might still be able to function um, and perform daily tasks, but again, it's it, it persists for several years. Then there's also depression related to substance and medication use. Um, and then there's also uh, depression due to a medical condition. I know also a lot of individuals that suffer from chronic pain um, may be at a higher risk of depression. So let's look at the common symptoms that we see uh, for depression in older adults. You know, that persistent sad, anxious, or empty feeling, uh, feelings of hopelessness, guilt, worthlessness, helplessness irritability, um, have, having trouble sitting still, um, a loss in interest of activities that were once pleasurable. Um, this is one that I think maybe people don't pay enough attention to. You know, if you're a loved one or the individual that you're, you're caring for, they always enjoyed, you know, getting out with their friends or going to, you know, plays or uh, their book club, and they've just kind of lost interest in those activities. Uh, that's a sign that there's probably something a little deeper going on. Maybe it's depression, maybe it's cognitive impairment, but that's something we definitely don't want to avoid. Um, also, decreased energy or fatigue, uh, moving a little more slowly, talking slower, uh, that changes in cognition, maybe difficulties concentrating, remembering, or decision making. We see that symptom specifically um, more often in the older adult population when it comes to depression. You know, any difficulty with their sleep, uh, maybe they're eating more or less, and that directly correlates correlates to any unplanned weight gain or loss. And then, of course, you know, we want to be tuned in to thoughts of death, suicide, or suicide attempts. We'll talk more about suicide in just a bit. And then if we shift our focus back over to anxiety, um, I mentioned earlier it's hard to know the prevalence because um, older adults, they might be resistant to seeking treatment due to the stigma or belief that it's a normal part of aging. Uh, and we know that anxiety is a natural response to life stressors. You know, a little bit of anxiety at certain points in our life can be good, it can be motivating, but it's concerning when it becomes overwhelming and persistent and interferes with daily life. Um, one interesting thing is it's less common to see anxiety in older adults than younger adults. Um, and it could be, again, back to that resilience that older adults have developed over their lifetime. Uh, but we do see general, general anxiety disorder as the most common anxiety disorder among older adults. But there are other types, you know, social anxiety, those phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so there are other types of anxiety. But again, it's important to know the symptoms so that we can recognize them and report them um, or encourage them, pardon me, to, to seek mental, uh, a mental health evaluation or, or medical assistance. So we have the symptoms like that uncontrolled feeling of panic or fear, apprehensive, apprehens apprehension, pardon me, um, those obsessive thoughts, um, 
restlessness, troubles with memory and focus, that insomnia, refusing to engage in activities, or maybe some ritualistic behavior, um, things that they do over and over again. But anxiety also can have some physical manifestations. And anxiety is something that I've struggled with throughout my life. And I know these physical signs are very familiar to me. So it's that racing heartbeat or heart palpitations, uh, a little trembling, hot flashes, headaches, uh, frequent urination. So again, if we're seeing these symptoms. We don't want to ignore them, uh, and we want to dig deeper. We want to make sure that they're seeking uh, a medical evaluation. So now I'm going to uh, pass it over to April. She's going to go over a few other uh, disorders that we see in the older population um, and then take us through uh, some of the other topics. Thank you, Lakeland. I'll assume you can hear me just fine. Yeah, just sitting here talking about anxiety uh, makes my heart race. Because, uh, Lakeland, we, we're not alone, um, especially today. There's so much going on. So anxiety and depression are huge. Uh, but we have to recognize there's many other types of disorders that may not necessarily qualify as mental illness, but they certainly impact uh, the individual's health and quality of life. And I think we can all take a look at this list and relate sleep disorders. I slept great until I went through menopause and then uh, no longer could I sleep and I, I never have been able to understand that. I'm reading a new book by an author called uh, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman and the book is the um, uh, uh, Forever Young and he's a directional director of functional medicine at Cleveland Clinic and he talks about all kinds of hallmarks of aging. It's a fascinating book and when he talks about sleep Lack of sleep can drive most of the hallmarks of aging. So the fact that we have more disease and disability as we age is not because of age. It's because of other things. So sleep is vital. And as Lakeland referenced, it can be a problem. And if we have an imbalance in our body and we're not sleeping, whether it's medication or it's hormones or it's stress, um, without that good sleep, it is going to impact all aspects of our mental health. Cognitive impairment, when a person has trouble remembering and learning new things, concentrating or making uh, difficult decisions or everyday decisions, and this can range from mild to severe. And there are many causes of cognitive uh, impairments, including medications. And as we know, most of our aging adults are on a lot of different medications. Delirium due to illness, infections, UTI, depression, and dementia. And I'll share with you a quick story because I think that you'll appreciate the, the concept of, of what happened to my Aunt Joy, I'm a caregiver for a family. And she went through several um, bad, bad infections and UTIs and lives alone. She has a son who's close by, and she has me about an hour away. I'd like to think that we were fairly informed, but this UTI had gotten so bad that she was having some severe delirium and um, a lot of various complications. Long story short, she was in and out of the hospital, came home, was falling over and over again, and we were very concerned. What is going on? Because, you know, we didn't, nothing was diagnosed yet. Um, so she goes back into the hospital again, and she's on her third skilled nursing stay. At this point, she's frightened to go home because of all of the things that had happened to her. And so she refused uh, to go home the day before discharge. And the nursing home, quite frankly, did not know what to do with her. Uh, so when she started talking about fear, when she started talking about hurting herself or not wanting to live, they ended up discharging her on a Friday afternoon before Memorial Day to a geriatric psych unit where she spent the weekend. Um, she clearly had no business being there, but because of the lack of collaborative coordination for her care. They didn't know what to do. And as soon as she said, um, you know, she didn't want to live anymore, they automatically assumed psych issue. They put her in this psych unit and uh, the second night that she was there, uh, she was attacked by another uh, resident and he attempted to choke her. So they discharged her and 
after that, she went home and um, she is thriving today. But I think it's a good example of what can happen with a simple cognitive impairment due to an infection that can spiral really, really bad. So um, lots of lots of things to look at here that are very, very concerning. Uh, neurological disorders, you know, epilepsy, brain tumors, ALS, all of these uh, contribute to um, issues related to mental health. Um, you know, obsessive compulsory disorders, OCD, I think is, is fascinating. And, um, you know, it's when people have recurring unwanted thoughts or ideas. And to get rid of those thoughts, they feel tri driven to do something um, repetitive. You know, you think of somebody washing their hands and, uh, you know, doing something over and over again, checking the doors. Um, this can severely impact someone's life. And hoarding is a form of OCD. And, um, you know, I feel like we hear so much much of this now. Uh, maybe not. I, I learned that only 6% of the population, 55 and over, are hoarders. Um, but that's pretty significant. And it's also a very, very dangerous um, OCD issue for aging adults because of the, the clutter and the safety and many people are not able to get out if there's an issue or they have a fall. So um, these are many disorders that really contribute to, um, you know, declines in mental health that we really should be aware of. You know, alcohol-related deaths among Americans age 65 and older have been rising for decades, and they sharply increased in 2020. Um, so we're seeing more of these things. So it's not just depression, anxiety, or, uh, you know, classic mental health issues. There's lots of things contributing. And one that I find fascinating uh, is PTSD. So let's look at that a little bit closer. Uh, I was at a conference last week and her, or excuse me, last year, heard a uh, professor talking about PTSD in aging. Uh, you might be just like me and thinking that, oh, when I think of PTSD, I think of military, I think of somebody who's been in war, and that's not the case. Uh, 70 to 90 percent of adults age 65 and over have been exposed to at least one potentially traumatic event during their lifetime. And I imagine as a result of that trauma, they're going to experience some PTSD. It's not just the military individuals. Um, and what was fascinating to me, and I had not considered uh, that this, this speaker talked about, was it often gets worse or is made more aware after retirement. So we plug through our life. Many of you are familiar with this model. We push, we work, we're, we're exhausted. We, we don't have time to think or dwell sometimes on our past trauma. Uh, but what she indicated is many times when people do um, stop, they stop working and they slow down, they start to recognize and they start to experience some of the impacts of the trauma that they have had. So I thought that was very fascinating. I think it's something to watch in the clients that we deal with uh, in, in the fact that, you know, perhaps they're starting to talk about things that were never a concern in their life or you weren't aware of them. All of a sudden they're struggling. It could be. They simply have time to acknowledge their pain. So it's never too late to address it. It's never too late to try to, um, you know, improve your experience uh, and outcomes from dealing with something related to trauma. Uh, there are gender differences uh, in the exposure rate. We certainly see, you know, males have a higher lifetime of exposure, um, but, you know, it, it really impacts everyone. Um, and it could be a risk factor for dementia. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's definitely something to think about and, and, and broaden our mindset in that it's not just about, um, you know, fighting in the war. It's, it's fighting in life. And there are so many things that we can um, experience. Older adults are at risk. And it's complicated. Right. Um, there are so many factors going on in the example of my Aunt Joy. We simply did not know. And because she lived alone, we were only getting bits and pieces of the information. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that 
that make them more at risk. And I think we also have to sort of talk a little bit here about ageism because um, I have a lot of friends who work in the ER uh, and I've heard their stories about those revolving patients who come into the ER um, and how um, they just simply don't know how to address them. And, um, you know, when they're coming in and just, you know, dealing with a, an issue at that time, I think there can be some ageism that we look at that person. We say, oh, gosh, here's another, you know, Mrs. Jones, and she's back again, and she's got this going on and that going on. And we just sort of look at them as another, um, you know, another aging person that ha is having problems. And it's so complicated, in my opinion, to get to the root problem in the healthcare system that it takes, it's going to take all of us really to do more talking. Um, uh, and, you know, one challenge in diagnosing mental health disorders among older adults is really distinguishing between what is, uh, you know, normal and age-related cognitive changes. So, you know, especially if we're not living with that person, we only see bits and pieces and we're kind of like trying to put together a puzzle to say, is this because, you know, mom is newly widowed? Is this, uh, is this a, the start of dementia? Is this, what is it, right? So it, it becomes more difficult and it requires interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think that's a challenge. Um, and we're, you know, healthcare in itself is challenged. We know that. You know, how much time do we get with a primary care physician to really talk about the issues? How are they going to put all of these things together? It's challenging. You know, when we have comorbidities and multiple chronic conditions, and we know 80% of aging adults have at least two chronic conditions, it's hard to really kind of put your fingers on what is going on. And as Lakeland mentioned, you know, there's common stressors of aging that can contribute. And I think when you are diagnosed with an illness or you have something that's changed the way you live your life, I think it's, it's uh, I, I won't say it's normal, but I think it's okay to know that that's going to be a challenge, but you can, you know, rise above it. We've got to talk about it. Um, and we've got to, we've got to listen. And I think that's really something that is a challenge for all of us in dealing with aging adults. There's, there is not enough time in our day. And sometimes we can just gloss right by things. And I think if we just stop a little bit and listen and encourage conversation, uh, you know, when somebody starts to talk about these things, as my aunt did in that uh, nursing home, um, and unfortunately, there was just a few staff there and there wasn't enough time, Medicare was discharging her, so when she started talking like that, the next uh, logical solution in, in the continuum of care was geriatric psych, and that clearly was not a good place uh, for her or probably anyone who was just suffering from, um, you know, a crisis in, in their experience going through an illness and then, you know, ending up in a, a geriatric psych unit. Um, when we look at, uh, at the mental health across the lifespan, we have to talk about suicide and the rates are higher among older adults compared to the general population. And I think we hear this every day in the news. Um, I keep a picture on my phone of uh, about, you know, 15 various, uh, you know, uh, um, um, people who were, um, you know, authors and, uh, you know, chefs and comedians, all these famous people who looked so happy who committed suicide. And, and it says, this is the face of suicide. So I think we have to really recognize older adults have elevated suicide rates at 24% higher than the national rate. So let's kind of talk a little bit more about that. And, you know, it's clear um, that while older adults comprise 12% of the population, they make up 18% of suicides. Um, in 2020, there was nearly 46,000 suicides that took place in the United States. Nine, over 9,000 of those were attributed to people over the age of 65. And symptoms of depression and anxiety are often overlooked and, in treat, and not treated because, you know, we're, again, we're trying to put these 
pieces together. I can share with you that I lost my own um, parents to murder suicide. Um, and it, it's not easy to talk about, and I know it's not easy to hear, but I think it's important to acknowledge the scope of what older adults are dealing with and their families. Um, and it's not a normal or usual part of aging, but it does happen. Um, and, you know, we've got to be able to talk about it. You know, when I covered that slide on PTSD, um, you know, it's been about five years since, since they're gone. And I have to admit that now that, uh, you know, I'm a little further removed from when it occurred, I do acknowledge that I have some uh, PTSD. I have experienced trauma because, unfortunately, I did find them. And as, you know, Lakeland was talking about, the language is so important, and I think it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, how do you talk? Because I feel like, well, I lost my parents to suicide. Did I? Um, you know, so I think we can do, you know, a better job of using the right language uh, to talk about this. Um, but the bottom line is we have to slow down, have the conversation, when somebody's talking about something and it gets your attention and there's a little red flag or you know, the hairs of your neck go up, um, stop and ask them. Tell me more. Tell me what you're thinking. How are you feeling? Let's talk about this. Uh, because I, if we leave it just to the healthcare and the clinicians alone, uh, we're going to lose more people. There's just no doubt. Um, there are warning signs, but as a gerontologist, Who's, uh, you know, whose family had committed murder-suicide, I can tell you, it's, you, you you'll always feel like, what happened? Um, I look at these warning signs, and um, I do see, I did see in my father, um, that there was agitation and there was rage. And unfortunately, that was not totally new for him, but now, of course, hindsight is 2020. I'm looking back and I think, boy, I should have known that. I should have seen that. Um, so, but when somebody is talking of suicide or talking of, um, about hopelessness and their behavior starts to change and you're seeing these different, peek up, pay attention, understand. Um, watch for those warning signs, reach out, understand what to do, who to call, where to seek help, um, secure firearms. I, I have to, you know, say on that day, my father had a lot of guns. He gave them all away on the day that he um, that he did this, except for one. So um, it does happen, and um, we just have to be aware and keep our eyes open and keep our hearts open and don't be afraid to talk. My biggest concern, really, with this, I think it's great that we're talking about it. I'm excited. I looked at the numbers, how many people are here. Um, the, the, my biggest concern is just the access to mental health. And if any of you have tried to get therapy or you've looked into things for a loved one, you'll see that there are barriers. Um, there are less mental health providers. Um, there is less payment for them. Uh, it is a challenge, and I agree with Lakeland. It's wonderful now that we have, um, you know, we have virtual health that we can log onto a computer. But we have to recognize um, somebody like my aunt who is there by herself, and and you know, it's not always convenient for somebody to to be there to log onto a computer and help her access that virtual visit. It's great, but quite frankly, we have a shortage of geriatric mental health providers. We have a shortage of geriatric. Uh, physicians. Um, I remember when I was coming up in my career many years ago, um, but it wasn't a lifetime ago, we had so many geriatric resources. Um, and I wonder, why has this changed, right? Um, and, you know, that's a topic for another day. Um, but um, just know that, um, you know, it, it is difficult now and, you know, we have to try to look for resources. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things in communities. I know that my aunt did find um, somebody who came to the house, actually, and she wasn't necessarily a licensed a clinical person, but she was somebody who came and talked to her, and it sure did help. Um, 
funding sources, I, I, again, is another issue, and we'll save that for another day. I, I'm curious on what your thoughts on of why there's such a lack of resources. We have to also encourage people that seek help. We have to have the right attitude. And I heard just a wonderful story the other day that um, I'm sure you've probably heard this before, but it's about a woman who's a widower now, and she's um, quite uh, I think she's like 85. Uh, she's moving into a senior living community, and they've got her in her wheelchair, you know, out in the hallway, and they're getting her room ready. And they finally come out, and they said, "Oh, I want to tell you about the curtains and the bedspread, and it's so pretty. I can't wait for you to see it." And she says, "I love it already." And the aide said, "You haven't even seen it." And she said, "Honey." I made up my mind a long time ago that my attitude uh, is really what sets my happiness. And I just love that story because I found myself waking up today and saying, okay, you know, change your attitude. It's going to be a great day. And, um, and sometimes we have to make that shift when we can. Um, I think another thing on here, you know, we can't underestimate the issue and the impact of lack of transportation. Many people don't drive, and while there's Uber and Lyft and all these great things and there is some local transportation, it is a barrier. So it makes it especially difficult. So, you know, you want to think that there's a lot of resources available, but if you're thinking, um, you know, that you have clients or your family may need help, look ahead. See what's out there and really understand what's available. Again, you know, the mental health industry for aging adults, um, you know, here's a summary. It's a lot of information. I don't want to go there, but I'll say that, you know, overall, we know that it's an issue. We understand that there's shortages. Rural counties are even more challenging, uh, but we need to start talking early. We need to address and get support. It may not even be that they need a clinical person, but, you know, how can we get more connected? You know, I think we've all heard the statistic that social isolation is as unhealthy as smoking a pack of cigarettes. So if we're concerned about mental health, we can also just try to have more connections, um, allow time uh, for people that we love who are aging, uh, and understand that just feeling apart and understanding their concerns. Um, you know, sometimes I, I can listen to something, you know, one of my aging relatives is saying, and I might be like, oh, gosh, you know, this isn't that important, or why does she keep talking about this? And I have to stop and say, for her, this is important, and it requires my attention, and that's going to help. And I'm happy to say with my Aunt Joy that she is thriving, and I just got tickets for her and I to go see Willie Nelson this summer. So um, she's on the mend, and I hope we can, you know, we can help many of our aging adults get there. Um, so I'm going to turn it over back to Lakeland to talk a little bit more uh, before we wrap up about mental health tips and what we can all do um, to assist. Thank you so much, April. And I, I really appreciate your stories that you've shared about your Aunt Joy and, and your, your family. And uh, I think that you know, sometimes hearing stories um, just kind of help make this all more real and more relatable. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, as as April mentioned, um, you know, we as professionals, um, we can educate those that we work with, the family caregivers, the aging adults, on ways that they um, can improve their mental health or ways that we can support older adults in their mental health. So, of course, first is that understanding and recognizing the symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, also, you know, understanding um, maybe where the source of this anxiety or depression is coming from. I know especially during the pandemic, news coverage was a source of anxiety for a lot of older adults. So uh, depending on the situation, perhaps it's limiting news coverage and ensuring that they're listening to credible sources um, or setting a limit on how much news intake that they have in a day. Also encouraging them to remain cognitively active. And uh, it might look different for everyone, but finding activities that they like to do that, that engage their brain, um, that give them a sense of purpose and meaning. Helping to also address those sleep issues. April talked about how important 
sleep is. Uh, and as we get older, I know my grandma talks about how she doesn't sleep as well as she used to, but if we can um, focus on kind of a sleep hygiene routine, uh, things like um, limiting caffeine later in the day or um, you know, not drinking liquids after a certain hour at night to prevent, you know, multiple bathroom trips, those types of things can help with some of those sleep issues. Also, exercise and eating healthy. Um, you know, of course, not every older adult has the ability to exercise, but even just getting up and walking around, getting outside into nature um, can really do wonders for mental health. Uh, you might also try practicing meditation. Uh, you might be met with some resistance on this, but meditation can be great uh, for calming the mind, uh, doing some reflecting, um, and helping to reduce that anxiety and stress. Also maintaining and developing those social connections. As April said, it's important for us to ensure that older adults are staying connected. And there's a lot of different ways that we can encourage this. Um, and again, maybe it's activities that provide that purpose. Um, maybe it's um, engaging with others at a, a local senior center or within a senior living community. Also, um, we talked a little bit about uh, substance abuse and um, or substance use and, and, and drinking alcohol. So stopping or managing that uh, can impact a person's mental health. And then, of course, seeking professional counseling. And then some other tips that we've, we've talked about all of this already, you know, checking in regularly, um, helping them to seek that medical care, managing medications. I think that oftentimes if we're seeing a change in a person's mood after they've added a medication or taken a medication out of uh, their routine, that could be a factor. So we never want to discredit uh, that. We want to look into that, make that uh, known to the healthcare provider. You know, offering to bring over a meal, run an errand for them, walk the dog, uh, just engaging in life with them. And I love how April said, you know, um, really listening and understanding what's important to them and uh, listening to what, you know, what's happening in their life. Um, and also, you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to feel needed. Again, that sense of purpose. So we can even just do simple things like seek wisdom and advice from them uh, and show them gratitude and appreciation. Uh, and then also, um, maybe, you know, we talked a lot about professional support in terms of uh, seeking, you know, counseling or therapy. Uh, but sometimes, um, you know, even having a companion in the home a couple days a week, such as home care, uh, we provide that at home instead. And I think one of the services we provide that's very under uh, appreciated is the companionship, just having someone to regularly talk with. So maybe even looking into that kind of service uh, could do wonders in improving a person's mood um, and mental health. And then I, I promise to talk again quickly about caregiving and mental health. Um, caregivers are at a higher risk of mental health conditions. So we want to be sure to encourage caregivers to manage their stress, especially if they're seeing those common signs of, of physical stress that are on, on the slide here. Uh, headaches, low energy, upset stomach, uh, insomnia. Uh, and we want to encourage them to take care of their physical health. It mirrors a lot of the tips that I just talked about, eating well, exercising, sleep, uh, and then making sure caregivers get time to recharge their batteries. I, I use the analogy a lot, but you know, my cell phone, I would never leave it off the charger at night. Uh, I need it to be charged up and ready to go for me the next day because it's my lifeline. I'm sure many of you feel the same. So, so caregivers um, need to also recharge their batteries, some time away to be refreshed. Uh, so we need to encourage that. And then also we need to encourage uh, positive, healthy ways for them to manage their emotions uh, because caregiving can be very emotional. There can be um, frustration. There can be joys. Uh, there can be sadness. And so, um, you know, trying to find a way to healthily express those, whether it's therapy or support group or a close friend or confidant, goes a really long way. And then also encouraging caregivers that it's okay to ask for help. It is okay. It doesn't mean that you're less than or a bad caregiver, uh, you know, caregiving does not have to happen alone in a silo. So we want to be sure that we, al we also focus on the caregivers, uh, and that probably includes some of you on the call too. You know, the last 
you know, three years have been really stressful uh, for so many folks that work in um, the aging sector, whether you're in community living or home care or health care. Uh, we've all been through a lot, probably something that we could put in that category of PTSD in a couple years uh, in some cases. And so we all need to be practicing, um, you know, healthy habits that um, support healthy mental health for ourselves as well. And then as promised, uh, I do have some resources here. Um, NAMI and the National Alliance for Caregiving, they put out a guide uh, called Circle of Care for Mental Health Caregivers. Uh, it's, it's a great guide, so you can download and check it out. Um, National Alliance for Caregiving is also uh, providing uh, kind of an open phone line right now for caregivers to talk about their mental well-being. So um, if you want to check that out, I encourage you to visit their website, caregiving.org. And then also we have the American Suicide, or sorry, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, all of their information. And if you didn't know, recently um, 988 can be called or texted for uh, suicide prevention and support. Um, and then also we have the American Psychological Association for, for Caregivers Briefcase, which uh, there's a link for there, along with the NAMI uh, website and a locator for a geriatric psychiatrist and for the local area agency on aging for additional support. So um, with that, I know we've covered a lot of information and we do have time for a couple questions. So we will turn it now over to the Q&A portion. Like Lynn, I'll, 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 I know we have so little time. I see a lot of questions yeah. in here. You know, a lot of people are asking, how do we get, you know, the aging adult to, to, you know, believe in mental health, to access and, and things like that. And I think it's important, you know, just to note that it doesn't always have to start with, uh, you know, a clinician or a mental health provider. You know, it can start with basic things that can help them improve their mood. Uh, so it's not always okay. Let's 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 get you into therapy. You know, uh, I'll mention my aunt loved Joyce Meyer, so I'll, we encouraged her to start reading again, to start journaling, and to start exercising. And that was part of her path. So sometimes it's just some simple things to improve their overall health and well-being, but then also accessing things, um, uh, you know, that are available to them. Mm. That's a really great yeah. point, That's April. Yeah. I'm just looking through some of these, and there's so many things. I wish we had more to talk about. Um, I see somebody uh, caring for someone with PTSD related to incarceration. Yeah, that's trauma. Um, I don't have experience with that, but I would imagine somebody does. Um, yeah, April, I think that bringing up that PTSD is, uh, I, I, maybe we need to do a whole webinar just on that, or someone should, because I think that yeah. it's so interesting, yeah. the various types of PTSD. And as you mentioned, we, we automatically think of veterans, but there's so many other types of PTSD that exist. And, uh, you know, even, um, you know, sexual abuse and assault, that also, mm -hmm. yeah. I know uh, for some individuals, especially if they develop cognitive impairment later in life, we start mm -hmm. to see maybe some dementia-related behaviors or information come out, um, you know, after they've been diagnosed or after they've gone through cognitive impairment because they're kind of reliving that PTSD or maybe that filter that they've lived with their whole life to keep that, you know, behind the doors uh, has been yeah. removed and now they're talking about it or um, maybe they have a fear of being in a community setting, something like that. So I think it's, it's just very, very fascinating and something I want to continue to look more into. Absolutely. And I see more of a theme about how do we get, you know, older adults to open up and to talk, people who uh, traditionally do not do that. It's kind of a closed book. And I think I go back to something that I, I keep uh, driving on and we'll be talking about next week, Lakeland at ASA, is asking, uh, you know, your loved one or your clients, what matters most to you? And if you mm -hmm. can really try to understand where they're coming from, then you can try to drive or start to uh, create some priorities for them to achieve that, 
right? So it may not be, oh, mom, I'm worried about you. Can can I take you in and get you an appointment? And can we talk about this? You know, maybe it's just that you're concerned and you say, well, you know, I'd love to hear what matters most to you or what your biggest concerns are. And then you can start to just build out some small goals and continue to observe and watch. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, an instant reaction to, oh, we, we're having a crisis here. Let's get help. Uh, but we have to get them talking and we have to do that by understanding understanding what's important to them, what their concerns are, not ours. That's such a great point, April. Yeah. Um, looking through some other questions that I know, well, we're out of time. So uh, okay. one thing I guess, yeah, <laughs> our, our emails are available in the deck. We'd love to hear from you. Please reach out. And I know we need to wrap it up. So Thank yeah, you. Well, thank you yeah. so much, uh, Lakeland and April. I feel like we can talk about this topic and all mm -hmm. the nuances that are within this topic for so long. Um, we would need more than, than just an hour, but thank you so much for the information that, that you have provided to us today. Um, it's been such a pleasure having you both here today, and we want to thank Home Instead for bringing this webinar to our audience. Please be sure to check out their upcoming webinars at, on our webpage at www.asaging.org and register for those in advance. And as a reminder, our CE application process has changed. Please review the step-by-step -step CE guidance uh, webpage linked in the CE application here tab on the left of your screen. It will also be included in your follow-up emails or on the webinar page when you go to register. There is a link right there to the guidance page. Um, review that before you submit an application. Um, remember that you will not be able to access the application for a minimum of two hours after viewing the event, although it may take a little longer for larger audiences, so we appreciate your patience. If you see a message uh, that you have not attended when you did, it's because the attendance data still needs some more time to sync, so please try back the next day. If you have any questions about the webinar, please feel free to email ASA at info at asaging.org. You can also go to our website, like I said, and check out the upcoming webinars. Um, if you would like to share today's information with anyone, the CEs are available for a full 60 days. Thank you again, Lakeland and April. Thank you, April, for sharing and feeling, um, you know, having this brave space to, to share your story. And thank you, Home Instead, and we hope you will all join us again soon. Thanks, everyone.